The big bank scam that nobody is talking about that's destroying our economy. I'm going to explain this to you in three simple, fast steps. Step number one, let's go over the main problem. The big banks are getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and the small banks, which are the growth engine of our economy, are being eliminated. There's this barrier that's been built around the big banks that eliminates competition. It prevents the smaller banks from coming in and competing with them. Things like compliance standards. As an example, if there's a new regulation that comes down the pipeline that costs $100 million to comply with, only banks that can afford the $100 million, like the big banks, will survive. And we see this with things like Dodd-Frank and Basel III. It's that old story with the arsonist and the firefighter being one in the same. Whenever we have a banking crisis, we always want the government to come in with all these new regulations to make the banking system quote unquote stronger. But what we don't realize is they're the problem. The government is the problem in the first place. More on that in just a moment. And we haven't even talked about the Fed that really prevents these small banks from competing with things like quantitative easing, 0% interest rates, negative interest rates especially, and flattening the yield curve. More on that in step number three when we discuss the end game. And you may be asking the question, well, George, why are these small banks important in the first place? To dive into greater detail, let's go straight to a clip from one of my favorites, Professor Richard Werner. What you will get is large banks only wanting to deal with large customers in order to do large deals. And that's also where you get the large bonuses. Well, we've done a study it's on the US, which has the biggest banking sector in the world, over 15,000 banks of all sizes and shapes. The very large banks deal with the very large customers, give very large loans. The medium-sized banks give medium-sized loans. Who is lending to small firms? It is only the small banks. Now, the UK doesn't have those. So the structure has become too concentrated, and what is badly needed in the UK is decentralization. One has to break up the, the financial sector and um, have much smaller units because small banks, community banks are locally accountable. You can't suddenly do a crazy project or you know, big corruption. So the big banks only do these huge loans to big corporations and the small and mid-sized banks, they're the ones that we really need to support small and mid-sized businesses that are so vital to the health of our economy. But that's not where the story ends. It gets more interesting when we think about how these small and mid-sized enterprises create jobs and goods and services, productivity. And to explain that further, let's go right back to the interview with Richard Werner. The banks create the money supply yes. by inventing these claims on themselves, the, you know, the fictitious deposits. That can be actually positive for the economy as long as this money creation is in line with the creation of new goods and services, uh, implementation of new technologies, and therefore adding value and adding value in the economy is funded by this money creation. If that happens, and we're talking about um, business investment, productive loans, productive bank credit, you will have no inflation. These loans can also be serviced and repaid. You have a stable economy without problems and with low inequality. And so countries that achieve this, that the banks lend mainly for productive purposes, whether it's Germany in much of its 200 year history or um, in the last Can century, the East Asian economies where bank credit was largely for productive purposes, then you're fine. But there's two more cases. I quickly need to point them out because that's the contrast. But, but just, just, just clarify that, that inequality is, is significantly it's lower. Lower, yes. Inflation is low. If, if, yes. And, and, the real, stable and, the, and the real economy thrives. Is booming, yes. That's when bank credit creation is focused on um, productive lending for productive purposes. As opposed to speculation and, and asset as, price. As opposed to, there's are two other types. If banks create credit for consumption, it's yes. obvious what's going to happen. You suddenly have more money create, created and more demand for goods, but it's the same amount of goods and services. So you're creating consumer price inflation. Price That's going. well understood, and, and central banks are watching that a little bit. And what's but the what's, what's less well understood is, and what's the biggest in the UK, 
um, it's probably more than 70% of all lending, um, actually way more than that, Mortgage, um, is yeah. bank credit creation, so money creation uh, for financial transactions, for asset transactions, for purchasing ownership rights. Now then you have a problem, why? Because you're creating new money, but you're not creating new goods and services. You're simply They're constant, aren't they? You're giving somebody new purchasing power over existing assets and therefore you must push up asset prices. The main takeaway is the reason these small banks are so important is because they support the small and mid-sized businesses. Let's think this through. We've got small bank number one right here and it's run by banker Bob. And he is very close to the community. He knows everybody in the neighborhood like Average Joe. And he's known Average Joe since they were little kids. They're in third grade together. They went to high school together. Maybe they played on the same football team. So they know each other extremely well. This is crucial. So Average Joe goes to Banker Bob and says, listen, Bob, I've got this fantastic idea for a business. I want to start a fishing store <laughs> that sells these fishing poles and fishing lures and it's going to be amazing and we're going to compete with Bass Pro Shop. And Banker Bob knows that Joe is someone that's hardworking and trustworthy. So he ends up giving him the loan. Joe creates this business that creates a lot of local jobs. He continues to grow the business and over time, maybe he does build something that competes with one of these big players, these big corporations like Bass Pro Shops. It creates a better economy and a more diversified economy. Instead of having all of our eggs in one basket with these huge banks and big corporations. And this is why you'll notice that a lot of these big corporations are in favor of things like compliance standards and the minimum wage because they know it eliminates people like the average Joe competing with them. And Joe never would have been able to get that loan from one of the big banks because he's not worth their time. It's such a small loan, it doesn't make sense. And they don't know Joe, they didn't go to third grade with him, they didn't play on the same football team. And whether we like it or not, that's really important to human beings. We prefer to do business with people we know well. So we've got these regulations that come in, eliminate competition, they increase the cost of compliance, and they divert lending and resources away from small and mid-sized businesses to these huge corporations. This weakens the economy. It consolidates everything. We've got all of our eggs in one basket. There's less value added to every individual. It only goes to a certain select group. It misallocates resources. There's no growth in the poor and middle class, I'd like to add. And notice I didn't say wealth inequality. I'm trying to get away from that term because I think we're too focused as a society about the gap between the poor and the wealthy instead of just trying to improve the lot of the poor. Don't we just want their standard of living going up regardless of what happens to the wealthy? Would we prefer that everyone was equally poor? I don't think so. And by not supporting these small and mid-sized businesses, we're really eliminating future growth, especially healthy growth that's sustainable. And we need that now more than ever when we're trying to go into a recovery. I can promise you one thing, we will not get a sustainable recovery focusing only on big banks, huge corporations, and government regulation. It's gonna need to come from everyday individuals like you and I starting businesses, creating jobs, and competing with the big guys. And a lot of you might be saying right now, well, George, that's impossible. The little guy can never compete with the big players. But what you don't understand is that small businesses are very nimble. They have a lot of advantages that people who have never been entrepreneurs don't recognize. Take it from me. I never ran a big, huge corporation, but I have run businesses from zero employees to 10 employees I've also run businesses with over a hundred employees. 
And although the business with 100 employees did have its advantages, it had a lot of disadvantages as well. It was very hard to move quickly, create a product or a new service because you had all these layers of management and human resources that you had to go through. I can't even imagine how difficult it would be if I had a thousand employees or if I was some huge corporation like Google or Facebook or Boeing. It would be almost impossible to do anything new and innovative. Where if you've got a little business with 10 or 15 employees, yes, you might not have the resources, but you can make decisions quickly and get to the market faster than these other guys. The bottom line, is you've got to realize there are a lot of advantages to being small. And if we support these people, they can compete. I can promise you that. But what is the ultimate solution? How do we prevent these monopolies from forming in the first place? To explain that, let's go right to someone who can do it a lot better than I can. That's right, Milton Friedman. How do you, and I, and I know you've answered these questions so you can hear your teeth crack, but how do you prevent monopoly? You've got to have constraints on monopoly. Okay. And isn't United Airlines too big? And look what happened when they went on strike. And should Pan Am absorb National Airlines, we're going to have three airlines when it's all over, and we're all going to be beholden to them. They're, everybody's going to be impersonal. You can see it now on the airlines. It, Nobody it, looks it, you in the it, eye anymore. Look at, look and they're giving paper cups in first class. <laughs> How's that for elitism? <laughs> but, well, uh, how you... personally, I don't see any objection to paper cups. <laughs> but let's go back. The problem with the kind of statement you're, you're making is to distinguish what's true from what's not true. The plain fact is that the main restriction on the number of airlines has been the Civil Aeronautics Board. From the time the Civil Aeronautics Board took over control of the airlines in the 1930s until now, until the deregulation, they did not authorize a single new trunk line. Because the number of trunk lines was less. Because they were owned by the airlines who didn't want more competition? Of course. Now, so the government happened, became what? then an agency to help the existing airlines not to have exactly, to compete. Exactly, exactly. Now, what happened with deregulation? You, you filled every seat in the airplane. And you had new airlines come in. The number of airlines has gone up, not down. It is true that there are some proposals to merge United and National. But they're Pan also Am Pan Am and National, I'm sorry. But there are also a bunch of new airlines that are coming out. Here's World Airways, whom you never heard of before, that's offering these cheap fares. Look at Freddie Laker. Freddie Laker broke the transatlantic uh, uh, monopoly. So the fact is that the best protection of the consumer, the best offense against monopoly, is, let me put it another way. There's an old saying if you want to catch a thief, you set a thief to catch him. If you want to catch a businessman monopoly, you send another businessman to break it down. You don't send a government civil servant after him. The most effective anti-monopoly legislation you could possibly have would be free trade. Okay. Step number two. Unfortunately, we're not headed for a free market solution. We are headed straight for the casino. In fact, we already went to the casino in the early 2000s and 2008, 2009 to the GFC. I know most of you understand how this works, but I wanted to put it up on the dry erase board. I think it's more impactful if we have a visual. It starts with the big banker himself, and this banker is named Jaime Demon, obviously Hispanic gentleman. He goes to the casino with $1,000 in this suitcase full of cash because he knows if he wins at the casino, he gets to keep the profit, but if he doesn't, he gets bailed out by the Fed and the government. So he goes straight to the roulette wheel, puts it down on red number four, and if he wins, now he has $2,000, but if he loses, like we said, he still has his $1,000 that he started with because the Fed and the government will bail him out through the form of additional taxes or future inflation. And we always kind of get fixated on this part of it, but we forget this part of it. So if the real economy started with $1,000 of purchasing power, after Jaime gets his butt handed to him at the roulette wheel, your drunk insolvent Uncle Sam says, oh, we got to raise your taxes. 
So that thousand dollars of purchasing power goes straight to Sam, then straight to Jaime. And if Sam doesn't increase your taxes, then he goes to the Fed and says, Fed, I've really got a problem. I need you to help me out. My back is against a wall. I promised Jaime that I'd bail him out last Tuesday when we had dinner and he came over to my house for cocaine and hookers, but I can't do it because these people, the average Joe and Jane, will be pissed if I increase their taxes. So the Fed says, no problem, Sam. We'll help you out. We'll print up all this funny money and buy your treasuries so you can bail out your crony Jaime. So the Fed monetizes the debt, increases base money and broad money, which will most likely lead to future inflation, whether that's for you right now, your kids or your grandkids. The bottom line is there's no getting around it. If Jaime loses at the casino, he'll be made whole, but your purchasing power will go from $1,000 down to zero. And you may be asking yourself, George, why is Jaime taking a knee all the time? Because Jaime knows it's way easier to virtue signal than to actually do something about the problem. Step number three, the potential shocking end game. And it is definitely stiff drink time. And in case you forget, I've got the bottle of Captain Morgan's, appropriately enough, right here in the Caribbean in St. Farts. So if you forget somehow during this step, this will always be the friendly reminder you need. But let's focus on this side of the dry erase board first. The Fed is right here with all those big banks, the primary dealers that are under the Fed's umbrella. And the Fed comes in with all of this liquidity through quantitative easing and a trillion dollars a day in repo commitments. This gives additional capacity to the balance sheets of primary dealer bank A, B, and C. They go right into the repo market. The money goes to the hedge funds, the financial institutions, take it to the stock market. Plus these dealer banks are going into the stock market themselves all this liquidity going in that drives prices up that means huge profits for all of these big banks because they're making their money on things like investment banking IPOs trading mergers and acquisitions and everybody's favorite derivatives creating credit default swaps collateralized loan obligations and mortgage-backed sausages. That's right, everything that creates a healthy, strong economy that we would want our banking system to do. Obviously, you can sense the sarcasm there. Compared to the small banks that actually make money by doing productive lending instead of these types of transactions that makes our economy weak and builds this house of cards. It's built on a foundation of sand. So Bob and Joe, going back to our example in step number one, and let's remove the Captain Morgan bottle. I'm sure you guys get my point by now. <laughs> but what Bob would do to make money, he wouldn't create derivatives. He wouldn't create mortgage-backed sausages. He would lend money to Joe. That's productive. Then Joe takes that money, creates a business, starts jobs, competes with the big corporations, and produces a strong, healthy, diversified economy. But in order for Bob to continue this type of productive lending, he needs a positive sloping yield curve. He needs a steep yield curve. In other words, if we have three-month T-bills, 10-year treasuries, and 30-year treasuries, he needs the 30-year treasury to yield a lot more than the short end of the yield curve at Fed funds rate or three months because his business model is that he borrows short and lends long. A way to think about that is his liabilities have a lower interest rate than his assets and he's pocketing the spread. But if the Fed comes in with quantitative easing to try to manage the yield curve, to flatten it out because they think it'll stimulate the economy, what happens to Bob is he can't make any money 
because now he's paying the same for his liabilities as he's getting for his assets. There's no spread. It doesn't go from 0% or call it like 1% up to 4%. If it stays at 1% the whole way, there's no way for Bob to make a profit. He goes out of business. And it makes matters worse if you create inflation. Because inflation is when Joe is paying Bob back with cheaper dollars. Therefore, Bob is taking a haircut and he can't create more loans in the future for Joe's kids or Joe's grandkids. So it's really this cycle. And it gets even worse when we look at negative interest rates. How can the small bank survive if they have to pay to give loans? Think about that. That's how they make their money. So if the way they make their money goes from a profit center to an actual expense, they're done. They're all going bust, which will completely destroy the real economy. Meanwhile, these big banks are making money hand over fist because they don't do any retail lending. They don't deal with Joe. They just deal with financial assets that are being propped up by the Fed. So let's really think this through. The Fed, if they're smart, and that's a big if, they know what they're doing is destroying the small banks, but they also know what they're doing with the big banks is creating these huge boom and bust cycles. It might be good for the Jaime's of the world while we have a boom, but when we have a bust, they need to go to the Fed to get a bailout. What happens though in the future if the Fed doesn't bail them out? They're holding all the cards. So we could go into this future scenario where all the small banks are completely wiped out. The power has been consolidated to these big banks, but the Fed is creating an environment where eventually they'll have to come into the Fed to survive. They'll need that bailout. And if the Fed doesn't extend the bailout to them, all of a sudden they're bust as well. And the only bank left standing is the Fed. The ultimate consolidation of power. See what I told you? <laughs> it's definitely stiff drink time. And for those of you who would like to see a video where I dive into greater detail on how this might play out, how the Fed might intentionally create havoc within the banking system to take all that power and to be the last man standing to where they control not only the entire economy, but most likely the entire country. Let me know in the comments below. For more content that'll help you build wealth and thrive in a world of out of control central banks and big governments, check out this playlist right here and I will see you on the next video.